Welcome everybody, my name is Krush AK and this is the Market Meditations Podcast. We chat with fascinating people from around the world to extract mindsets, routines, stories and habits to help you build richer lives. Meditators, this podcast is with Sahil Bloom. Sahil and I dive into the world of investing. We discuss financial education and how it should be ideally taught. I get Sahil's perspective on Bitcoin coming from a more traditional background. And what I particularly enjoyed was discussing how Sahil managed to bounce back from some of the most crushing failures in his life. Sahil, thanks so much for joining me, man. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's great of you to come on. I've been following you on Twitter quite a bit recently, and you are a fantastic storyteller. I've really enjoyed seeing you break down financial topics and just make them really simple, exciting, and engaging. It's something which a lot of people don't learn in school. So it's really awesome that you're doing it on Twitter. What got you started doing that? Yeah, it's it's a great question. You know, I always just had this general feeling about the world of of finance in particular that things were getting overcomplicated uh, by the quote unquote experts, right? You, you yeah. have this whole like idea that, you know, I'm an expert, so I need to use all the jargon and complicate mm-hmm. things because I need to insulate my job from disruption. Like that that is in general my my perception of what the finance industry has done. And so I've always noticed, you know, with family, with friends, teammates from my sports playing days, it, I was getting all these questions from people about concepts in finance that for some reason, just weren't getting across to them. And and they weren't particularly challenging to understand for any individual, but the information wasn't getting to them in a way that was digestible, accessible, et cetera. And so I kind of just took to Twitter, this is back in May, um, as a means to explain those Mm -hmm. topics to people uh, and, and started using storytelling as the way to do that. I grew up in like a storytelling household. My mom is a phenomenal storyteller, writer, um, you know, exaggerates a bit. We come from an India, a half Indian family. My mom is Indian and in an Indian culture, I feel like there's a lot of storytelling and embellishment. And so I kind of grew up around that, uh, and tried to weave that into how I was telling stories to explain these financial concepts. Well, uh, I actually didn't know you had a half Indian background. That is awesome. Uh, I wouldn't have guessed. I just assumed you were fully American. Uh, yeah, no, now- my, uh, My mom is from India. Uh, All of my family on my mom's side is in Bangalore. Uh, And then she came over to the States for college uh, where she met my dad, uh, who is American, white. And so that's kind of the genesis of my name, like Sahil, the kind of Indian uh, Arabic name. Uh, And then Bloom is the, you know, (laughs) the white American (laughs) side of me. A great combo. Now, uh, (laughs) you mentioned something that... um, I hadn't thought of before because when I think of financial education being poorly conveyed to people, normally I think that's a problem with the school system and the education system. Like so many of my friends, uh, I'm now uh, 25 years old and I have friends that have come out of school that still don't know what inflation is. They don't understand that just because the number value of their cash is the same in the bank, they're losing money by keeping it in the bank. So, you know, it's outrageous. But you mentioned something I haven't heard before, that it's specifically the financial industries that want to make it a harder topic for people to understand. Yeah, yeah. You know, I have it. I I think it's both, right? I, I think you're absolutely right. The education system that we have, for some reason, places zero priority or emphasis on financial education, financial literacy, which is a huge issue. And it's a whole separate issue because I think You know, I'm learning in school about the Ming Dynasty. I'm learning about mitochondria. Uh, I'm learning about geometry, but I'm not learning about taxes. I'm not learning about budgeting. I'm not learning about wealth creation, investing, equity. Um, And those things are equally, if not more important to how you actually live your life. I, I don't want to detract from any of the other sciences. I think they're extremely important. But I should learn about those things in school. All all children should, because it becomes extremely impactful for your ability to take care of your family, take care of your friends, et cetera, as you grow. So I I kind of take that as one whole side of the issue that needs to get solved. I have some things in the works trying to work on that with people. And there's a lot of platforms that are trying to solve that. But the other side of the coin, as you point out, is this whole idea that the entire financial 
ecosystem um, has been created around keeping the insiders in and keeping the outsiders out. Um, and, and this is the case with a lot of industries, right? Because as an insider, quote unquote, you want to insulate yourself from disruption. Uh, you mm-hmm. benefit from the current system. You're making a lot of money from it. People are paying you fees to manage their money. Um, people are uh, you know, paying more for things that they shouldn't. There's economic rent being generated by the current system for the people that are the insiders. And so they don't mm-hmm. have an incentive. It's all incentives, right? They don't have an incentive to blow up that current system by educating the rebels, you know, by arming the rebels, i.e. the new people coming in, the outsiders, with the information necessary to do it themselves. Isn't that what the government for, though? <laughs> Isn't that what the government's for? You know, I, <laughs> we could spend a whole hour probably talking about my opinions on the government and the issues there. I, I think, yes, I mean, look, I, I think that, the government, I think large corporations, I think, you know, it's the the kind of the top 1% of the world. It, it's all surrounding a system that has worked for them, right? And mm-hmm. it's kept, it's like cronyism, right? Crony capitalism. We see it in the developing world as a horrible issue, but we have it in the developed world just as much and no one talks about it. Um, and, and it's a big issue. And to me, the way to fix that is through education directly to the people. Um, Mm -hmm. and so I use Twitter. I think there are other platforms that are going to give you, you know, uh, a chance to do it. But Twitter to me was a great way to just get information to people in a way that they can digest and understand. And frankly, a lot of people might not like it because I'm kind of simplifying things that do have a lot of layers to complexity Mm -hmm. of, of complexity to them. Um, but it makes it accessible for people. And all of a sudden people that felt like they were left behind by a system are seeing that actually, I understand this. I can, I can get how this works. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's powerful to me. And I, and I've seen it in the way people have shared the information, you know, messages I get from people saying they're thankful for it. And it's really, you know, to, to me, it's really powerful. And I really appreciate the, the kind of the response that it elicits in people. Well, I mean, I, I, on the one hand, I fully see how uh, individuals like yourself can uh, give education and really help people and really make a difference. I mean, uh, you've now got over 40,000 followers. There are a lot of people that are seeing the message you put out, and it's having a difference for sure. Like a small number of people do get to learn, but as a macro solution, um, what is the way to solve it in your opinion? Because uh, I often think, yeah, the government should be teaching it, but is it in the government's interest to have its citizens um, not generating economic activity, investing, getting assets and saving uh, versus uh, going out and spending and being consumers? Yeah, it's a good question. Look, I mean, my my general perspective is smaller government. Um, So anytime, you know, at least in my opinion, when you mm-hmm. when you start to ask the government to solve things and create solutions for, you know, for big problems like this, I tend to think they bungle it <laughs> one way or another. <laughs> they, they, they tend to not be great at coming up with solutions. Yeah. And so I, I like to think that private enterprise and, and capitalism is the solution to a lot of these things. And so as people continue to create innovative solutions for education, I think that is going to be the ultimate way. But there needs to be a breakup of the status quo. Like we, we need to stop viewing outsiders as, um, as children almost, you know, like Mm -hmm. the financial media, there's this massive surge of new excitement and interest in trading and investing. Everyone's talking about Robin hood and the growth and, you know, the rise of, uh, the Dave Portnoy's of the world, you know, arming (laughs) the rebels And, and the whole message around it in the financial media and in the financial world has been, these people are going to get blown up. They're going to lose their shirts. The market's going to crash. They don't know what they're doing. And look, that might be true that they're not armed with information today, but why not fix that by giving them the information? Why why are we trying to just put those people down and say, oh, you don't know what you're doing. Give it to people that do know what they're doing. Why not try to teach them so that they do know what they're doing? Um, And that's the fundamental difference to me about how most people want to approach this topic versus how I would like to, um, is that let's fix the education gap uh, that exists. And I think to your point earlier, it starts from the ground up. I think we need to start educating on financial education, financial literacy from the ground up. And look, investing in the economy 
it doesn't need to mean saving and people are hoarding cash sitting around. It can mean investing in productive assets. I mean, like Warren Buffett, one of my investing heroes, he's all about put your money to work in productive assets. And those productive assets are producing for the economy. They're producing for shareholders. They're creating jobs. And, and that's a great thing for everybody. If you have more people that are doing those growth begets growth in that case. So why you, as an insider, um, to quote yourself, um, don't want to make any assumptions, do, do you have this different opinion? What, what in your life has led you to want to educate people rather than you're on the inside now, you're profitable on the inside, I want to keep this edge to myself? Yeah, it, you know, look, I, I grew up, I, I mentioned it, in a multicultural household. Um, I grew up going to India every single year of my life, spending time with with family and, and friends there. And so I saw, you know, the opportunity gap that exists in this world firsthand. Um, and a lot of people are experiencing it. And so to me, the question, the, the fundamental issue is always talent is evenly distributed. Opportunity is not. Um, you hear that phrase a lot. It really rings true with me. And I think the way to solve that is through education. It's mm -hmm. something I just personally believe uh, it's just fundamental to who I am and what I want to be and embody as a person is fixing that issue. And whether that's through my you know, kind of current side project, passion project on Twitter, or whether it's through you know, running for office or doing something someday where I can really influence policy at a higher level. It's something I'm passionate about. M you know, making money is not the end all be all of my life. I, I want to try to leave a mark and create change in some way for the better to leave people better off. Um, and so, you know, me being an insider, I, I think it gives me information because I see the way this world operates. Um, I understand the world of finance. I'm in it. I understand the concepts well. And so I'm able to disseminate it. Um, but this is not who I am. Uh, if, I, if I were just to put it that way, it's something I do. It's not who I am. Uh, so I love what you said about um, going every summer and spending it in India because I'm British born and raised, but both of my parents are from Iran. So I actually spent every single summer going there as well. And also that side of my family, I don't know about yours, is not as well off. So one of the reasons uh, I do a lot of similar things, which is share the financial information, is because I've had that exposure to that side of the world. I'm not disconnected from it. And you you can see that everyone there is just as capable as everything someone on another side of the world is. So opportunity is everything. Like if the opportunities are equal, it's fine. Uh, it's mindset, I think, which should, should be the determinant and uh, how much an individual puts forward as to how successful they are. Now, I know you had a heavy sports back. You have a heavy sports background, mm -hmm. and that was a big part of your upbringing. And one, I know a lot of our non-US listeners uh, don't fully understand the sports culture in America. I've had students over here who wanted to tune in and watch college sports, like they they were mad if they missed it. Uh, but here, college sports are irrelevant to like the social uh, life and structures. Like the average person and has no idea what's going on in college. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your sports upbringing and transition into how that mindset helps you now and how that's made you the person you are today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I played baseball um, my uh, my whole life. I, I, played, I played a lot of different sports. I played basketball, baseball, um, soccer, or I guess football for, um, for those across the pond. But uh, baseball was always what, kind of stuck with me. Um, I was a pitcher, so that's like a bowler in cricket if it, <laughs> for a UK audience. Um, and uh, I always could just throw a ball harder than most people for whatever reason. I just, <laughs> my arm just worked in that way. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to go and play in college. Uh, and to your point, college sports in the United States have uh, a lot, you know, a big following and a lot of excitement around them. Baseball, not quite as much as uh, American football, um, but we had a lot of big crowds and played in a lot of incredible venues. Um, and so I, you know, it w was very fortunate, got to play on a lot of fantastic teams and develop a lot of life skills um, as a result of my, my participation there. Um, you know, some of the biggest things I've learned in my life were from getting like punched in the mouth uh, in, in a baseball context, right? Like some of the biggest 
transformative moments of my life as I look back and reflect on them are from massive failures, um, not from the successes and the times where you like raised your arms up in the air in victory. It was always from when you got knocked down, what you learned and how you ended up bouncing back from that. And so that's something I talk about with a lot of young people now when I'm giving advice or um, trying to help people as they're progressing in their personal professional careers is you need to find situations where you're uncomfortable and where you're likely to encounter that that failure that's going to transform how you think about things and how you pursue different opportunities. Uh, so could you, um, as someone who would love to, and I know our listeners would as well, uh, learn from one of your failures, could you share one which you think would particularly benefit our audience? There's two that really jump out to me. You know, the first one is the first day I arrived at Stanford. Um, I had grown up in a small town in Massachusetts um, and baseball wasn't huge in Massachusetts. Um, it's it's a cold weather region and it's a warm weather sport. So it wasn't a huge sport. Um, and so I was kind of the like prototypical um, big fish in a small pond growing up where I thought I was I thought I was like God's gift to everything, man. I was just, I was arrogant. Um, I was just kind of a jerk. I, I really don't like who I was, um, you know, in my high school days and at that age. It's something I, I genuinely really regret. Um, but I went to Stanford, um, was fortunate enough to get this scholarship. And the first day I showed up and I went to practice and I went to class. And I just remember going home that night and being like, holy hell, you know, I am not good at baseball. <laughs> like these guys are way better than me. Uh, I'm not smart these people are way smarter than me that are in my classes. Like I'm really going to have to lock it in and get my shit together. Excuse my language. If I'm going to, if I'm going to excel and if I'm going to do anything, I'm going to really have to grind. This isn't just going to be some cakewalk where I can come in and big fish in a small pond here. I mean, I got, you know, punched in the mouth metaphorically, um, both athletically and academically my freshman year and really had to, had to kind of rise through that adversity and figure out how was I going to make my way? Um, because I realized I wasn't that smart. I wasn't that talented at baseball and I had to come through that. Um, that was one. And that was a, a really transformative moment for me right from the get go. The other one um, is more of a funny one because it's in my Twitter bio, um, which you might have seen. But I my junior year, we're playing in really the biggest game of my life. Um, we're on national television on ESPN. Uh, playing in a game at Florida State. Uh, and I come into the game, a relief pitcher, late relief. It's a close game. Bases are loaded. And I gave up a grand slam, which is like the absolute worst thing you can possibly do in the sport of baseball as a pitcher is give up a grand slam. Uh, and I did it. And I make the joke on Twitter now because I can laugh about it, that the ball is still flying somewhere. It's still like <laughs> taking off in orbit. Um, but, you know, that was like, the most crushing moment in my life to date. And, and that's a blessing to be able to say that something on a baseball field is the most crushing moment in your life, but it really was, you know, it's in front of 20,000 people. Um, you've worked your entire life for this moment and to fail that miserably on such a grand stage, it feels like the whole world is collapsing around you. Um, and so learning from that and learning to be able to laugh about something like that and bounce back from it, um, is just something that's really stuck with me. Um, and it allows you to not take yourself so seriously, which I think is really important in life because at the end of the day, we're all dead. And so <laughs> you just need to be able to laugh at yourself and have fun. Um, and those, I mean, those two moments are really what jump out to me as lessons that I learned along the way. Wow, those were um, intense moments. I could feel you, you on that pitch uh, on national television. That is... It, that, I can't even imagine that. I've never had that much attention and exposure on me and in such a high pressure situation, because it's one thing for me to tweet to a few people or make a YouTube video or even come on a live stream, but to be in that stadium playing this intense game with a whole bunch of other people. Sahil, both in that instance and the other one, how did you not crumble? Like what made you rise up instead of, you know, crumble and give up? Yeah, it, it's a really good question. I mean, I, I always just grew up and my parents always instilled in me um, consistency as being extremely important to who you are as a person and, and to your ethos and core values. And it, my dad's thing was always just like you punch the clock every day, day in, day out, whether you know his grandfather was a vegetable peddler on the streets in New York. 
And he said he was the hardest working guy he knew. He would go every single day out to the block, work 12 hours a day. And he was just punching the clock. He wasn't going to make a ton of money. He wasn't going to excel and be remembered in any way, shape or form by the history books. But there was something so noble about just going and punching the clock day in and day out. And so to me, I always, whether it was athletically or academically or now professionally, that was always what I wanted to embody was that punch the clock mentality. Just show up and day in, day out, people can count on you. Your teammates can count on you. And you know that no matter what happens, you're going to show up the next day. You're going to punch the clock. You're going to go get the next task done. Um, and there's something admirable about that. And I have so much respect for people that do that day in, day out. Um, whether they are setting the world on fire with their performance every day, I actually couldn't care less about. I, I just think there's something so incredible about somebody that you know you can count on to show up um, and just get the job done day in and day out. A relentless work ethic is uh, a consistent theme I've had on this podcast. Every single successful person just has this uh, trigger in their brain that says, I'm going to continue moving forward no matter what. Yeah. And it yeah. makes me <laughs> makes me wonder how much is taught, how much is genetic? Uh, is it a certain wiring in the brain? Is it a personality trait? Can it be trained? I mean, it, yeah. what are your thoughts? I, I think um, I, I think you just need a wiring. There's like a hardwired thing. I mean, I I say it a lot. And my wife gets my wife gets pissed at me about it, but I have like a I almost feel like I'm sick in the head sometimes. <laughs> like I, I have a sickening, maniacal uh, ability to focus and and uh, a work ethic that I don't know who taught me it. I, I know I've seen it in my dad growing up, um, the way he continues to work to this day. Um, but a lot of people just don't have that. And, and I actually, I think that's fine. I don't think you, you need to have that to succeed mm -hmm. or do well. Um, you need to have passion uh, in order to do well. I I've never seen someone, quote unquote, succeed without genuine excitement about what they're doing and what they're working on. I think that is an ultimate prerequisite. The insane work ethic and consistency, I think, is like what you see where people take it above and beyond and are going to the next level in whatever they're doing. Um, but that's something I pride myself on, man. I mean, if there's if there's one thing I can say... I feel genuinely differentiates me about people that I quote unquote compete with and anything that I do is like, I, I'm willing to die rather than lose at whatever it is. Like if I'm going head to head, yeah, I always heard like Will Smith. I always loved this. Um, he, he's, he was saying when he gets on a treadmill, if you're next to him on the treadmill and you guys are running, you're running against him. He says, either you're going <laughs> to, either you're going to quit or I'm going to die. Uh, because that's how much his work ethic means to him and how far he's willing to push himself. Um, and that's something I feel about myself is I just know there's nothing that can break me. Like I've been broken. I've pushed myself through incredible mental things, um, physically and mentally, um, over the course of my life to harden that skill. Um, and I just know I have it in me now, no matter what, to dig as deep as I need to dig on anything for my family, for my friends, for my work, whatever it might be. I'm, I'm with you on that one, man. Like, uh, life experiences can definitely mold that. And um, I've been tested. I don't know if I've been tested hard enough yet, but I I can relate with you. Push through no matter what. And just, it's a, it's a stoic mentality. Like, I want to get something. All external factors are irrelevant. I need to do everything I can at every moment to continue chasing what I want. And that's the only time where I'm okay to not get what I want. I've done every yep. single thing I possibly could. Yeah, um, and, yeah and the, stoic, the stoic mentality, as you say, I mean, it's control what you can control and leave the rest that you can't just out of your realm of worry, right? Um, I think that's such an important way to live life. A lot of our listeners don't know, uh, what are you doing professionally right now? Yeah, so I, I am a vice president at a uh, private equity fund in the San Francisco Bay Area. So for, for those that aren't familiar with private equity, other than movies and like, you know, negative uh, <laughs> uh, representations of it, we invest in private companies. So we make investments in businesses, try to improve them over a period of call it three to seven years, and then 
um, and then sell our stake or take the business public um, in order to capture a return for our investors. So we invest capital on behalf of large institutions, educational endowments, pension funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds, high net worth individuals, et cetera. And uh, do you have your own uh, like consulting arm which comes in and helps make these businesses better? How does that work? Yeah, so we have um, we have a lot of resources internally that we use. We have you know what's called a portfolio operations group, which is essentially like think of it as like Bain and McKinsey consultants that come mm-hmm. in and help you to improve the business and to create value. And um, you know, for us as a as a firm. Our whole um, kind of ethos and mandate is to actually drive earnings growth at our businesses and drive growth um, versus uh, financial engineering. You, you kind of have a lot of private equity funds that go about, they take on a lot of debt and you kind of cross your fingers, hope it works well. And if it does, you make money. And if it doesn't, things blow up. Um, we try to take a much more fundamental approach to really growing the businesses and to drive investment returns via really improving the businesses over time. And how has that worked out for you guys? It's been great. Um, it's been a great experience. I, uh, I particularly focus on consumer brands. Um, so I help to run our consumer investing vertical. Um, so I'm on the board of a couple of consumer brands in the portfolio that are really awesome businesses, very, very cool businesses that have been fun to be involved with. And, you know, a lot of that in the consumer world is navigating this whole shift towards the e-commerce and digital economy. Um, you know, you, you're going from 10 years ago, having an economy based on brick and mortar retail sales to now an economy largely based on e-commerce and at home shopping. Um, and so navigating that with the businesses has been the big trend, I would say, over the last five years. Uh, and how does someone from your world view the cryptocurrency world? Because uh, you've been on Twitter now, you've, you've had a lot of exposure to what's going on here. Um what are your general thoughts on it? Well, my general thoughts are that everyone should have uh, should have Bitcoin as part of their mm-hmm. portfolio. Um, I, I don't know if everyone's seen the Chamath interview that he just did. Um, I think it was on CNBC where he was talking about Bitcoin and its role. And, and I would say I'm largely aligned with with him on this. In that, you know, I, I view it as you know, at, at the kind of downside scenario, I think it is a hedge against the ruling class. It's like it is a hedge against these institutions that have been around forever and that will ultimately fail because all institutions eventually fail. Um, and the upside is I think it completely replaces our, you know, our current financial system and you end up in a future world where it is extraordinarily valuable. And, uh, you know, the early adopters of the technology will be the ones that, um, that got out in front of it. Um, but in my view, I, I view Bitcoin personally as somewhere between the digital gold thesis and the replace the entire financial system thesis. Um, and for me, it's just a massive asymmetric opportunity today. Um, with the amount of people that actually understand it and have dug into the technology and understand it being, you know, in my mind, maybe 1% of the population. And we're sitting at, you know, close to $11,000 per Bitcoin. Just imagine where things are headed once more people start to understand the technology, understand the potential and where it could possibly go. Uh, assuming nothing else comes to replace it, which uh, hasn't for a while and it doesn't look like it will. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's a great question. I, I think that that's like, that's the, um, I think it was in, in maybe it was in Bitcoin Standard that I, mm-hmm. that I read that for the first time, uh, which is a f- phenomenal book, by the way. But, um, you know, he talks about whether, whether Bitcoin ends up being the like ask Jeeves to some, something else is Google. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's a, a genuine concern, um, and, you know, and one that could come about if you think about, you know, if you think about it as technological uh, innovation, Bitcoin as technology and, uh, you know, a powerful one at that, does something else come along that replaces it? Or does it end up just being the building block and things are built on top of it over time or innovations are made to it? And I, I would mm-hmm. bet on the latter um, and that it continues to be a part of the ecosystem going forward. But that's just my personal opinion. Uh, I mean, one thing I'm personally paying attention to is just the market cap, taking a bit of an index fund approach. As long as the majority of the market cap is in Bitcoin, the majority of crypto earnings should be Bitcoin focused. In my case, it's over 90% Bitcoin focused. And if I start to see a shift there, then I'm happy to come in late and shift there rather than take on a huge risk. What are your thoughts there? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's a great approach. Um, I think that's a great approach. I mean, there are some platforms now that are basically offering you a market cap weighted index of cryptocurrencies where yeah. you can kind of just buy and it essentially is an index fund the way you're talking about it. I think that's I think it's a good approach. Um, but I just keep coming back to I mean, for everybody having some percentage allocation of your portfolio in Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies is a is a critical thing for me in this day and age, in particular right now in this moment, given what we're seeing from central banks globally um, mm-hmm. and just the like massive disrespect for the fiat currency that that is uh, that is happening with all of the money printing globally. And not just what we're seeing there, but like idealistically, it would be fantastic for society to lose out on a huge bunch of inefficient middlemen that are no longer necessary given the technology we have and don't really yeah. offer much value. Like think of how much yeah. faster the world would move. Well, think about, I mean, your family in Iran, my family in India, like right now, cross border, if you're trying to send money to people, the inefficiencies mm-hmm. and the money that middlemen are taking all along the way and how long it takes the money to get from your bank account in the US or in the UK to your family's bank account, wherever they are, it's ludicrous. I mean, we live in a we live in a digital and technological age. How is it possible that I need to pay a $30 wire fee to send money from here to my family? If I want to send $5,000, I want to send $1,000 and it's not going to appear in their bank account for five days? I mean, it's like, it's ludicrous, right? I mean, I can send them an email and it appears in their inbox instantaneously, but if I want to send mm-hmm. a little bit of money, it takes that long. So there are things like that where it just clicks with you and you're like, wow, this makes no sense. Um, and it just feels like with those kind of technologies that are coming and with, you know, with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency being the the kind of the railways or the new railways for a new system, uh, changes changes coming. I mean, uh, I know in 2017, 2018, I personally know people in Iran that were willing to pay a two to three X premium in order to change a large amount of money into Bitcoin because they were that desperate to move money out. And the financial systems that are set up were limiting their freedoms that much. So it would be fantastic to see a big move in that direction. And now we've spoken a lot about Bitcoin. What about the other sort of cryptocurrency companies that are coming up? I can see a smile on your face. What are your thoughts with regards to uh, those companies? Uh, are they, because we're seeing a lot of bubbles, most of them disappear. You spoke about index funds. I, I actually don't like owning an index fund of the top crypto assets right now because historically the turnover is so high that it would mm-hmm. actually be unpro- most index funds are unprofitable in that regard. So I just prefer going for Bitcoin alone uh do you have you guys looked at any cryptocurrencies have you personally looked at any cryptocurrency companies that aren't bitcoin and perhaps uh more mid to small market caps i haven't personally we we wouldn't i mean we typically don't invest in in uh you know like hard tech in that way um so haven't as an institution i obviously have a lot of friends and people that i know in the Mm -hmm. ecosystem that spend a lot of time in that space um but i i think it's not dissimilar from what you see in the early days um of any new innovation where you know there's one thing that kind of kickstarts it in this case it was bitcoin and then you have a ton of new kind of supply, quote unquote, that floods mm-hmm. into the market to go capitalize on the opportunity. I mean, we saw it in 2017 with the very obvious bubble. I think a lot of them, you know, blew up the bit connects of the world or whatever that were obviously fraudulent. There were some that just didn't really have a good fundamental grounding in them that will go away. Um but is it a winner take all environment? It seems like there are cryptocurrencies that have different use cases that are, you know, fundamentally different. Ethereum, um, you know, fundamentally different. The ability to program on top of it and create these systems um, is unique. And so I, uh, you know, I'm not well educated enough on these things to sit here and have mm-hmm. a like extremely constructive conversation with you. But it's something that I pay attention to and something that I always plan to allocate some percentage of my assets towards. In the event, even if it's insurance, right? Even if you consider it an insurance policy against that becoming the next thing, mm-hmm. um, or you want the upside reward to to connect to it, um, that that's kind of my general perspective on it. How do you split your own personal portfolio separate to the fund? What sort of assets you like investing in? Obviously, you said Bitcoin. Um, are you? What are your thoughts on property, stock market in general? Yeah. Yeah, I'm big on hard assets right now, Mm -hmm. um, in particular in this environment. I mean, in 2020, 
hard assets have been my almost my entire focus. I've continued to and will continue to until it blows up dollar cost average into the equity markets in assets that I really like. Um, you know, and it's always been technology assets, things that I thought were on the forefront that I think will continue to do well um, and that have pricing power. And so that can manage, you know, in an inflationary environment being, um, you know, b- m- able to maintain their position over time. Um, so I've, I've continued to have a, you know, a portfolio in, in equity markets. But for me, land, property, you know, real scarce assets, right? Like we're not creating more land on earth. So until Mm -hmm. Elon Musk figures out how to get us to colonize Mars, land is going to have a, you know, a real value. And so I, uh, you know, I continue to focus on hard assets. I've had a probably disproportionately large allocation towards hard assets like Bitcoin, like gold, precious metals, uh, land, property, et cetera, um, over the course of the last 12 months. And I personally will probably continue to. Um, I am just, you know, in general, so much of my um, kind of net worth is tied to investments we've made in the fund and in our mm-hmm. in our investment funds and also startups and different things I've done on a personal basis um, that I almost feel like my liquid portfolio has to be heavily skewed towards these hard kind of hedge asset classes um, in order to kind of hedge my exposure to the dollar and to fiat in general. Uh, it's. I love what you said about um, how your personal situation hugely affects how you do your own personal investing and uh, really applies to everyone, which is why there isn't a one size fits all. You should have this much percentage allocation yep. here, here and here, which is what most people want to learn and is why people like you educating um the population on investment in general is so important because you need to have a understanding to know how to manage your own portfolio to reach your goals. It's not as simple. It's almost like a language you need to learn to be able to speak. Yeah. yeah, I think that's absolutely right. You know, to me, it's like I would characterize it as I don't want to give people the answers. I want to give them the ability to think so that they can come up with their answers for themselves. Um, you know, me, me telling you, oh, allocate X percent to this and X percent to this, X percent, it just, it makes no sense because if I'm, I'm 29, I don't have kids yet, I'm married, but I don't have kids. It's very different than for my friend who is 34 and has three kids and, you know, uh, two houses and he needs to figure out how to plan for his, his career and he wants to retire and he doesn't have a high paying job. It's just a very different situation. Um, and, and so my goal is just to give people, to arm people with the information so that they can make educated financial decisions, build wealth over time, take care of their families. I mean, it's the things we all want to do. Um, you want to be able to spend time with your families. You're building wealth because you want to enjoy life while you're around, right? It's all finite and we don't have endless time here and you want to be able to spend it and enjoy it. Uh, now, one thing you said which um, got me wondering is generally I suggest to people that, um, well, obviously it's not financial advice. I can't give financial advice. I'm not yet qualified. Um, but index funds hugely are better to dollar cost average into with regards to the equity mar- market uh, than specific individual stocks. Now, you said um, specific tech stocks, which you like to weight towards yourself. Uh, would you recommend that to someone who doesn't have your level of experience and involvement in the industry? It's funny you ask it. So I actually don't invest in individual stocks. Um, when I say uh, when I say that I'm investing in specific tech stocks, I actually do it through ETFs or funds that are low cost that I dollar mm-hmm. cost average into. Part of that is because via my job, I'm actually not allowed to invest in individual stocks because we often get mm-hmm. uh, material non-public information on individual companies, and so they were not allowed to invest in stocks. But I have found, I mean. My portfolio's performance is just as good as anybody's that was picking stocks this year. And I was just dollar cost averaging into into equity index funds. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can, I mean, you can find today any, I mean, if you want, if you're really bullish on, um, you know, cybersecurity, there are five different low cost ETF funds that you can invest in the cybersecurity industry and invest into the five best names basically in that industry. If you love esports, like you can invest in the esports um, industry. And so for me, I just think about 
I think about it like that on kind of a sub industry um, level and try to find what the right names are that I want to be in and then find an index um, that kind of ties to that. And because of how broad that industry is now and how wide the, the ETF market has become, you have the ability to go do that. Uh, but is that any like... Who is qualified to be able to do that? So we have like the vanguards who can give you an index of absolutely everything. And I know a lot yeah. of other companies do as well. But e even when you're picking specific industry specific index funds, don't you require? Is it enough to just love something and be passionate about it or do even do a few days or weeks of research? Does that really give you an edge or are you not better off just taking a broad overview, a really humble approach and assuming you know nothing? I mean, I think most people, the vast majority of people would be best served by just not thinking about it much and just <laughs> putting their money into a, you know, broad stock market index or the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ 100 and just dollar cost averaging into it. I, and frankly, no one really outperforms the market long term. Like <laughs> it just doesn't happen. That's the whole thing. And so if you sit back and you think you can by spending a few minutes on it here and there, it's just a little bit arrogant in general. I, I personally, the reason I do it is because I have an opinion on what the future looks like that has been guided by a lot of research and also a lot of thought that I've put into it. I may be totally wrong. And if I'm wrong and I miss the mark and you know, it only appreciates at 5% per year versus 8% per year, I'll be okay. Um, but, you know, if, if most people just want to, you know, they work and they don't have time to do the research on these things and they don't have strong perspectives on it, then the best bet is really just a dollar cost average into assets, period. Whether it's, you know, Bitcoin, whether it's equity markets, that, that's based on your own allocation. Um, but dollar cost averaging to me is like the lifeblood of all of these strategies. Trying to time markets is the hardest and most fruitless exercise I can possibly uh, imagine. I mean, you're talking to a trader. I do that quite a lot. Um, but yeah. um, that's, yeah, different. I, that's different, right? I mean, there's, you know, trading and investing. I, I separate the two. Um, you know, I sure do I trade now and then like I'll buy put options when I think the market gets heated, I'll short things every now and then. And that's just for fun. Like that's trading mm -hmm. to me. But the majority of your portfolio long term, and I think Scott does a great job talking about this, you do a great job talking about this. The majority of your portfolio and your wealth creation comes from investing and it's mm -hmm. five, 10, 15 year horizons. And so that shouldn't matter whether you know, if I buy Bitcoin at 10,725 versus 10,500, who cares if it's going to a hundred plus, right? Like it doesn't, it didn't matter at the end of the day. And so when, when you believe that things are fundamentally going up in the long term, you just need to stop trying to time the market on it. If you, if you have it, if it's a trade and in your mind, you're trying to get in and out and you're trying to capture profit and that's what it is. And you can identify it as that. I think it's great. And then, you know, you have some process and systems in place in order to make that work. Um, but I just try to differentiate between the two in my own mind, emotionally mm -hmm. and professionally so that you can actually execute it well. Well, um, I actually, I'm so skeptical, skeptical, of trading in general, that I view my investing and passive investing as a necessary and also disproportionate hedge against the trading. Because um, the uh, I have a mathematics background, so uh, statistic focus. So I'm all about mm -hmm. data and looking at data. And the data we use to build trading systems, especially in the crypto market where there isn't that much price history to use, um, is very limited coupled with the fact that there is very little hard evidence, specifically in the academic world, that um, price data can be translated into an edge and it's not just random luck, just a random walk going up and down, mm -hmm. uh, makes me very skeptical of trading in general. Though my sample size of the past uh, almost four years now has been successful, so I do yeah. continue it. But with that long-term perspective in mind, keep building investments, keep building these safe assets so if and when the edge does disappear, it doesn't cost me anything. It doesn't hurt me. Or if there was no edge and with the flip side comes around, the losing streak comes around, everything's going to be fine. So I do advise for everyone, firstly, not to trade full time. Trading full time for a living sounds awful to me. The stress that comes with it, the difficult, the emotional difficulties, the reliance on the income making you trade worse. Uh, and yeah, I guess that's why you're in a, your firm, you said, does a lot of fundamental analysis and focus yeah, on... 
Yeah, it's long term and it's real fundamental value creation oriented. It's not trades. You know, we're not financial engineering. Um, and I think that that's important. I, I mean, it's to, to your point, I just always do the math on it, too. Right. Like unless you are managing a liquid portfolio of a million dollars um, or above, it just doesn't move the needle a lot on your life, whether you're outperforming the market. And even at a million dollars, it doesn't really, right? Like an 8%, say you're like a long-term 8% market return on a million dollar portfolio, that's $80,000. So if you're managing to outperform the market dramatically and generate 15%, say, um, you're only making an additional $70,000 above what the market would have gotten you. And you're not going to do that long-term. The vast, I mean, like if, if you do please contact me and I will invest all my money with you if you've somehow done that. Um, but in, you know, it's an extra $70,000 pay taxes on it. It's an extra 50. Um, it, so it's not going to dramatically move the needle on your lifestyle. Um, and that, so really until you have a portfolio that's like well in excess of a million dollars of liquid assets, it, it's just like, you're better off spending that time on finding new income streams or on generating more income. Um, it's a more productive activity. And there, there are a few people that are pretty good about educating folks on that. Um, but that's just my general opinion on it. I think if you love trading and you're passionate about it, you love investing, you love the markets, then it's a totally different story. Um, if it's just what you love and it makes you happy, by all means, man, go do it. Um, I'm all for people just enjoying what they do on a daily basis. But from an actual pure economic rationality perspective, I think for most people spending all of their time trading their portfolio is probably not the most like dollar um, uh, dollar rational thing to do. Well, uh, trading actually replaced a um, video game habit I had for ages. So oh, yeah, there you go. it was quite nice. And exactly, I really enjoy it. And I also limit my overall portfolio size. So I won't trade with an amount which I get any sort of discomfort from. So it's extremely fun. It's lucrative for now and um, comes alongside other stuff. And I'm glad you share that opinion with regards to trading. Uh, mathematically, it makes perfect sense uh, I just, uh, when you look at the compound rates and how much money can go up to if you do outperform at that, race, at that rate. Now, so uh outside of what you learn from the firm how else do you grow how else do you learn more um what are the best ways to expand your knowledge with regards to not just the markets but um any aspect of life yeah i think the couple for me are reading i read a ton um and i read broadly um you know i read everything mm -hmm. from fiction, nonfiction, history, biographies. I, I'm kind of all over the map, whatever piques my interest. That's one. The other one is just broadening your network um, of both peers and mentors um, that can kind of expose you to new and interesting concepts, mm -hmm. ideas, and people. Um, I've always found that like my greatest that I get to meet and interact with and engage with that push me, that champion my career or or my uh, professional life. And that is, that's made all the difference for me personally. Uh, I, that's one of the best things about this podcast. I get incredibly intelligent, successful people like yourself come on and I get to speak to you for an hour, which is incredible. Now, with regards to books, uh, what books would you recommend? What are your uh, top three books if you had to give for someone trying to learn either entrepreneurship or the markets? Hmm. Interesting. Um, well, maybe do one for so, each. Yeah. My, my favorite book of all time is Atlas Shrugged, um, which is a epically long book, um, but is so, so foundational to um, capitalism and how I think about the world. And it's particularly relevant right now, given a lot of things that are happening in the world. So that, that would be my number one. Um, my... My number two is probably anything by um, by Taleb. Um, you know, I, I like Anti Fragile was incredible. The Black Swan was incredible. Fooled by Randomness was incredible. I just I'm a huge huge fan of his work and the way he thinks. I, I always try to um, fr from people like him and from other kind of thinkers, I try to find and identify, it's not mental models necessarily, but w w different ways to think about the world and to kind of um, place things in context that I see in real time. And his books are just so great at helping you think. 
Um, so those would be my others. Uh, you know, the other book that was pretty transformational for me just on a personal level was When Breath Becomes Air um, by uh, Paul Kalanathy. Um, he, was a, he was a Stanford uh, neurosurgeon um, who at age 40, right before becoming a full neurosurgeon practicing, um, found out he had stage four lung cancer. Um, and he wrote the book in his last one year of life before he passed away. It was terminal. He was married. Um, and it is so, so powerful. And it's all about, you know, your own mortality um, and how how much of a driving influence that that is in your life uh, and how you think about the world around you. And it was just I mean, I when I first read it, I'm not ashamed to admit this. When I read it, I was on a plane and I was just crying sitting there reading the book. And like the woman next to me was like, are you okay? Is that like, she probably thought a family member died or something. And I was just like this, it's so, so powerful, the book. Um, and has really changed the way I think about my relationships, why I do what I do, why I wake up in the morning and get excited about different things. Um, just truly foundational. Oh, well, uh, I know the next few books I'm going to be reading. <laughs> I'm quite familiar with Taleb's work, but um, Atlas, Sh Atlas Shrugged, I had a go once, but I had it on a Kindle. So it was so big and it was so awkwardly worded on the Kindle. I'm going to get the hard copy of that and try yeah, out. Yeah, get a hard copy or get the audiobook um, mm -hmm. and just listen to it. Listen to it on some walks. Um, and frankly, it's one where... If you listen to the first half of it or the first third of it, you'll start to get the point of it and you'll mm -hmm. see how powerful it is um, and, and, and foundational it is. Uh, you spoke about mental models. Uh, what sort of mental models have you managed to pick up from these people you've learned from? <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's a lot uh, and they all float around in my head and I tend to not be particularly... Um, structured when I use them. I know a lot of people are like, I'm going to use this mental model right now <laughs> to do this. Um, I am not one of those people. I, um, you know, I think I, I try to think clearly um, about anything that comes up. I find myself, you know, using like Occam's razor um, quite a bit, you know, the, the kind of the simple path um, mental model, but I'm but not a... That? It's, you know, the idea that the, the best solution is, is often the simplest, um, okay. like if you're dealing with a complex problem. Um, and so I find myself using that a lot. Um, I, I find myself using inversion a lot, like figuring out the opposite of a, uh, of a solution to something, you know, like if, if I'm trying to find the best path to do something, figure out what would lead to the exact opposite outcome that I want, and then use that to craft your solution. Um, but I am not by any means a you know a mental model guru. I know like Farnham Street and and the folks over there have done a great job of creating you know a total library around the like Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett mm -hmm. mental models, um, and I love that stuff. But I am by no means an expert at any of it. And what what are the next steps for you with regards to Twitter and your journey into this space? Oh man, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. I, um, I've got a bunch of cool things in the works. I will say that, um, some of it I want to leave, uh, leave as a bit of a surprise. Um, I've gotten connected through this world with some really cool people. Um, and, uh, have, I have always been really blessed to, to have a, a network of mentors who have really, um, been supportive and helped me along the way for no gain for themselves, which is continues to be amazing to me. Um, but through that and through some people I've met, there are some cool things that, that I'm going to be working on and, and coming, uh, you know, kind of coming soon and pulling together. I I've always wanted to do, you know, some form of like illustrated children's books with some of these things. And I think that that'll be a fun project. I I'd love to pull that together and start. I don't know if it's probably multiple volumes at this point, because there's too many stories out there that I've done, but, um, but I want to do that. And so I, I need to find an illustrator to help me um, kind of create the magic on that stuff. But, but there will be a lot of interesting stuff coming. Um, and uh, we'll see. I don't know. I, I've kind of, you know, I've only been doing it for it's October now. I've been doing it for five months. Um, I started in May. So it's all very new to me and it's been organic and I, I'm just excited to see where it goes. I'm still really enjoying it, enjoying engaging with people, notwithstanding some of the mean comments I get on, on Twitter every now and then. Uh, so I love that that's what you're doing. That is going to be such a beautiful impact on the world. Uh, it's such a, it, it just, 
it reflects everything you've said you are and it's great to see the actions of someone and their goals and aspirations back um their words as well so uh, it's been awesome having you uh on the show man i uh, really enjoyed talking to you i've learned and a lot i'm going to listen back on this episode as soon as we're done um i've made notes of all the books uh, is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners with before uh we end this episode no, I really appreciate you having me on. It's, you know, it's been a real, uh, it's been a real honor getting to chat with people like yourself. I, I don't feel myself worthy of any of these conversations, but it's, uh, it's been just a blast. And so I, I hope that your listeners take something out of it and, um, and are able to go about and feel slightly more well-educated as they bounce around and they can find me on Twitter or, or wherever. I'm pretty good about responding to messages. So feel free to reach out. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Market Meditations podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like us to continue bringing you fascinating people from across the world, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you like to listen to these podcasts and share the episode with a friend. If you have feedback or an idea for a potential guest, reach out to me on Twitter at Karush AK. And do not forget, we write a newsletter covering all important topics in crypto and traditional markets. We send it out three times a week the market meditations newsletter you also get early access to these episodes and you get transcripts and extra notes as well so make sure to subscribe there as well